I'm Bruce Fumi, and I want to tell you about the event that has become one of the most renowned and celebrated in the history of Border Reaven. That time and that people where kings and queens of Scotland and England meant little, but family name, local allegiances and ill-gotten gain meant everything. You crossed the border and you took what you could before coming home to the protection of your lands and peoples. But there was always risk of those on the other side crossing the border in the other direction. Now, you've all heard of Rob Roy, but today I want to tell you about a character at least as notorious and certainly more colourful, Kinmont Willie. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. This is the Clan Armstrong Museum at Gilnockie Tower. It's where Kinmont Willie's granddad Johnny Armstrong had based his reaving operations before James V had him hanged in 1530, the year that Willie was born. Now James may have thought that that would have been an end to reaving, but Johnny's son, Lang Sandy Armstrong, was reputed to be the worst reaver ever. Of course, Johnny's grandson, was Kinmont Willie, as notorious a reaver as you'll find. They say that at the age of 12, Willie was in the saddle at the Battle of Solway Moss, riding against that Scottish king who'd hung his granddad. Whether his daring escapade started quite that early or not, there's one thing for sure. He lived a life that was full. He led raids in England to steal horses, sheep, cows and goats. And let's be honest, anything he could get his hands on. And since we're playing truth or dare, he would have done some bad stuff along the way. There's a tendency for us to diminish the heinous crimes of our heroes. Ah, he didn't really stand as a Tory councillor, he just voted Liberal Democrat once. And it was a tactical vote in a three-way marginal. I mean, what can I say? It's the borders. Ah, he did some bad stuff right enough. But he would have justified it in the code of honour that prevailed in his world of border reavers. Now, Robin Hood had the Sheriff of Nottingham, Rob Roy had the Duke of Montrose, and Kinmont Willie had Lord Scrope of Bolton. He was the warden of the marches on the English side of the border. His job was to keep English land and property safe, and he complained that justice would never be done because Kinmont Willie was a friend of the Warden of the Marches on the Scottish side of the border and DAMN YOU KINMONT WILLIE! He wasn't happy. Indeed, as Lord Scrope grew older, he grew embittered that every time a plan was made to capture this border freebooter, he'd escape in the nick of time. Uh. Apparently it never occurred to him that his deputy being married to Kinmont Willie's daughter might be a bit of a security risk. When Lord Scrope died, the next Lord Scrope was determined to do better. But a year later, Kinmont Willie and his accomplices ran a big daylight raid into Tyndale and drove 3,000 beasts back across the border. The duplicitous deputy was sent out to catch them, but he only managed to arrest two English reavers. And he lost them on the way home. The deputy warden was fired but Kinmont Willie continued in his job. The 17th of March 1596 was a truce day. Now, the truce ran all the way through the night till sunrise the next morning. It was so that reavers could attend hearings. You see, reavers may be from two countries on opposing sides of the border, but from time to time they had issues to settle. It was a bit like a marriage guidance counsellor saying, Look, Rose, why don't you tell Jock how it makes you feel when he steals your cattle and Jock will listen with an open mind and at the end of it all, we might find some common ground. And if not, we hang the prisoner. What do you say? This is the Scottish-English border. It runs up and down the Kers Hope burn there and then under this bridge and along the little water heading west. Now, the meeting was held in that field, other side of those trees and beyond the Kershope burn, and Kinmont Willie was there. 
Afterwards, Willie headed home on this side of the little water and a group of Englishmen headed home on the other side. Willie felt safe. There was water between them. And it was a truce day. One way or another, somebody shouts, Your da's a dick! Somebody retorts, Your ma's a fud! Before you know it, dicks and fuds were in the air, passing water. The English think, Nobody's taking the piss out of my dick. And before you know it, Kinmont Willie's in chains and heading off to Carlisle Castle. On a truce day! Now, the young Lord Scroat knew that he had no right to hold Kinmont Willie. Did I say scroat instead of scrope? He was a ball bag. Did I tell you that they'd taken Willie on a truce day? Ah! But Willie had rubbed up against the old scrope the wrong way for years. He'd also evaded the young scrope's clutches. He had to be locked up. On the Scottish side of the border, the key law officer was Walter Scott of Buccleuch. He writes to the new deputy warden. No reply. He writes to young Lord Scrope. Nope. He writes to the English ambassador in Scotland. Not so much as a Ferrero Rocher. Insult was being added to the injury of false imprisonment. For the two generations, royal families north and south of the border had intermarried and it produced a Scottish king who would inherit the English throne just seven years from now and an English queen who paid him an annual subsidy in the meantime. No help was coming. But Reavers had been their own people for centuries. Cannon Bay was an Armstrong centre just down the River S from Gilnocky Tower. We're less than three miles from the English border and on the night of the 7th of April, a select group of men met to make plans. Kinmont's brother-in-law and two of his men, Scott of Buccleu and two of his kinsmen and that sacked deputy warden of the English marches along with his brother. Some Scots, some English, Reavers all. They met to plan a raid on the strongest castle in the north of England. An all-out attack would be folly and inevitably end in failure. This would be surreptitious. This would be sneaky. This would be in the dead of night. The plan would take shape a week later. Because this is Langham Racecourse. And on the 13th of April 1596, there was a race meeting in Langham that would have brought people from all around together in one place. Racing, cheering, gambling. Celebrating well into the night. It was the perfect cover for Walter Scott of Buccleu and his chosen riders to meet without suspicion. And then, at dusk, head out in the Carlisle Road. Now this is Carlisle Castle. Now the only reason I can come to places like this is because of the wonderful people who support this channel by buying coffee on a one-off basis, link in the description below, or becoming Patreon members on a monthly basis, click the white tab up there. And I want to say a huge thanks to all of those people that have done either. You'll see some of their names in the credits at the end. Obviously, feel free to join them. Now, intelligence from the English contingent told our rescue team that Kinmont Willie was held in a building just inside this western wall of Carlisle Castle. A contingent of spearmen were sent to the Irish Gate up at that corner wall in case the party were discovered and the guards came from outside the castle. Meanwhile, Buccleu and his small group approached a postern gate in this western wall. Now, can you see that gate up in the wall there? Now, if I told you that I knew for sure that that was the gate, then I'd be a lion. But that was definitely the gate. One of the men used a chisel and a crowbar to remove the stone piece from the wall next to the lock in the gate, and they were in. There was little resistance. Laziness, cowardice, bribery, or all three meant a lack of response from the guards. Within minutes, 
They'd found Ken Montwilly, put him on a pony, and they were heading at speed back north towards the River Eden, the River Esk, and Scotland. What these men saw as an issue of honour sparked a diplomatic incident. Elizabeth England demanded that Scott of Buccleuch be sent to London to be dealt with. James VI refused to send his countrymen. But James was in a sticky situation. Not only did he hope to succeed Elizabeth, but for the last ten years he'd been receiving an annual payment from her. And of course, money from London never comes without strings attached. One way or another, Buccleuch saved James' embarrassment by going voluntarily. And after questioning, impressed Elizabeth so much that she said, with 10,000 such men, our brother in Scotland might shake the firmest throne of Europe. In a way, I suppose he did. People in the US often ask me to talk about what they call Scotch-Irish and what we call Ulster Scots. You see, a few years after he took the English throne, plantation-building lowland Scots were sent by James to the north of Ireland, including border reavers. Far better to have them in those debatable lands than in these. Generations passed, and some of them travelled the Atlantic to become the hardy people who threw themselves into the border troubles with indigenous people. And of course, in the 1770s, they helped shake the firmest throne in Europe. As for the Armstrongs, long after the Stuart Kings were gone, it was one of their name who became the first man to set foot on the lunar surface to bring back booty from the moon. Now that was taking Raven to a whole new level. For another tale about the English borderlands, click the link coming up on screen now. In the meantime, Hamian Dochus can be a lamb alive. Cheerio and Rasta.